So this particular session is, is based on how the um, pandemic has impacted um, family violence, um, both over the last couple of years and how it's, I would anticipate it to impact it um, over the next several years. Um, I'll probably wait just another minute or so and then get into it um, just to make sure that everyone's in the right and correct breakout room. And I'll plan to speak for right about an hour or so um, to allow some time for questions um, at the end. I think this particular session is 75 minutes, so I'll plan to speak for about 60 or so um, and allow some time for questions. I'll give it just one more minute and then we will get going. All right, so when I think about, you know, family violence, and I talked about it um, in the, the session um, that preceded this one, um, and I'll talk about it again, obviously, I talk about it often in, in most of my presentations. You know, I, I, it's certainly an issue that always has my attention. I recently got my master's in, in public health, so I'm, I'm concerned with all public health issues. But when anything happens, I tend to view it through the lens of family violence, again, my area of focus. So very early on um, in the pandemic, early on in 2020, um, even paying attention to what was happening in other countries and, and the, the measures they were taking, such as um, lockdowns and things such as that, um, I was very concerned about what would happen here in the U.S. if we did the same. Again, understanding um, that, that the pandemic is, is serious. Um, um, and certainly, I, I, I think a response is appropriate. But again, I, I kind of get concerned when it seems like we put all of our eggs in one basket. So when we focus all of our energy in public health on one issue, we can tend to lose sight of some of the other issues um, and how they're going to be impacted, right? And so I think sometimes the idea was, well, we need to fight COVID now and, and make it go away. Um, but, and again, I, I get that and I'm, I'm supportive of, of finding measures to do it. But if we're not accounting for the other side of the seesaw, it's going to lead to, to you know, issues for years and years to come. And I think that's the situation we're in now, um, particularly with violence, um, with suicide, with things, um, substance abuse, other things. We're, I mean, just across the board, all of these issues that were bad before are just so much worse now, it looks like. Um, and, and I think, unfortunately, it's going to stay that way for a while. Um, but at, at least understanding, you know, why some of these things have happened, um, thinking about the actions we took and how it impacted these things, I think can kind of provide at least a, an opportunity, again, to learn from it. Um, and at least try to improve our response. As I said, I, I began to be very concerned looking internationally, particularly there in China. Um, you know, obviously they were in lockdowns before the US was a couple months prior to us. And we were seeing what they were reporting was a doubling and a tripling in reports of DV in January and February. And that most of those cases were related to COVID-19 in some way in terms of whether it were lockdowns or things such as that. Um, we were seeing increases in other countries as well as the year would go on. Um, and again, I, I, I was very concerned very early about where things were trending. Um, I wrote this paper as kind of a predictive piece saying that, you know, and, and I wrote this in early 2020, it was published there in the early April. You know, if the U.S. Um, were to do lockdowns, were to do these types of things, um, I think it's going to have a, a very negative effect on family violence. Um, the, the paper here, unfortunately, kind of, it was predictive when I wrote it, but unfortunately it followed it things have happened the way I, I predicted they might. Um, it's been cited now in over a thousand different studies um, and uh, was cited by the CDC when they recommended uh, reopening schools finally um, um, after they had been closed for quite some time. Some of the things I addressed though in the paper um, are, are these particular actions, right? And again, it's good to take actions um, when we think about public health and in this particular case, wanting to slow the pandemic, but I don't think we fully recognized and understood how it would impact um, other issues um, and that obviously being family violence. Um, so when we close schools and libraries and, and churches, I mean, those are kind of the big three for, for families impacted by family violence. Um, obviously children sometimes are only safe when they're at school. Um, libraries are a key resource for victims of, of partner abuse and maybe the only time when they have internet access that they know isn't being closely monitored. And churches can be a, a sense and, and, and source of report for these victims. So again, closing all of the three of those really disrupted routines, 
um, really created a, a bad scenario for victims. Um, closing bars and restaurants may not be as obvious, but the reality is, is many of the highest risk perps and um, for abuse um, are substance abusers. They abuse alcohol and so um, and, and other substances often. Um, so when, you know, the places in public to drink stopped, you know, it's not like they're going to stop drinking. They're just even more likely probably to drink in the home. Um, children and, and adults also um, being obviously more likely to be in the home because schools were closed, uh, places of work closed. Again, we created this scenario where risk was dramatically increased. Well, opportunity to detect abuse was significantly diminished. We have essentially worst case scenarios for a lot of these families where victims are literally finding themselves trapped in a home with the abuser. Um, one point to that that I'll make from this paper that you see here that I, that I published there in 2017. Um, and for this particular paper, I looked at partner abuse and, and um, since I utilized police reports, I could put a, you know, a specific day of the week where the event occurred. And what I noted um, was that we saw the most police reports for domestic violence on Sundays. I've repeated this now in, in multiple states and in other communities as well. Interestingly, when you look at it, it's, it's not Sunday morning, it's not Saturday night spilling into Sunday morning. It's Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. You know, and what, um, when, I, when I get into the whys, um, what I hear often is, you know, perpetrators say, well, um, you know, it was, the, you know, Sunday is, is the only day of the week we're all in the home together. No one's at work or at school. Um, you know, Sunday, um, I was stressed out thinking about going to work Monday. And so things spilled over. Um, the kids were worked up, not wanting to go to school in the morning. They were going crazy. And so, you know, the incident occurred. Again, there's never any excuse for abuse. But when we think about all of the reasons that I've just described and, and the reasons why abuse may be more likely to occur on Sunday, you know, think back to the lockdown scenario. You know, essentially when we did lockdowns, we created weeks and even months of Sundays. Essentially everything um, that's there that uh, victims or and even perps identify as reasons for why abuse may occur on a Sunday um, was there every day of the week for a long period of time. So again, very concerned. I, I don't think, um, I, I think it's very realistic to assume that abuse of adults and children was occurring quite frequently during lockdown. Um, I think new normals were created. So again, in homes where abuse hadn't occurred before, it might've started. And in homes where abuse was occurring, I think it got worse. Uh, we know that when children reside in a home where partner abuse occurs, they're at 60 times the risk compared to the general child population of suffering abuse or neglect. Um, so again, all reasons to believe that abuse was very bad during lockdowns and no reason to believe that it just stopped. Um, usually abuse outside of um, effective intervention, it only increases in severity and frequency. And we know that obviously there would be nothing safe about being trapped for that long with an abusive um, and perp or a perpetrator of abuse. I've had many um, survivors of family violence come to me or, and did even at this time and say, hey, if, if you know, I just want you to know if, um, you know, if I had been trapped or if I had been in my abusive relationship or in the relationship with the, the, the perpetrator of or who, the individual who abused me during a lockdown, I don't know if I would have survived it. I'm just terrified the thought of, of being trapped with an individual like that, the way many victims were for an extended period of time. One of the things I was hearing early on, and I still kind of hear, is that there was no precedent for design to intervene. Um, and, and, you know, the idea of kind of we're learning as we go. Um, but I, I disagreed. I thought that there might be some precedent for intervention design and even to help give us an idea of what to expect in the future. And for me, it was the natural disaster literature. You know, when, when I look in the, in the literature, um, I find um, a lot of examples of uh, um, exploring how natural disasters impact family violence. While we don't have the same you know, when we think of a natural disaster, we think of just major physical destruction. Um, and, and we didn't have that with the pandemic, but the underlying characteristics created by these events seems to mirror, mirror in my mind what happened during the pandemic. And so I think it gives us some, some, some idea of, of what to expect and, and how long these increases we're seeing in family violence are likely to occur. You know, when we look at key characteristics described after natural disasters, we see these things here controlling behaviors, key community organizations closed, um, but obviously, like I said, a disruption of routine, sudden unemployment and, and less resources, more stress, low social support. Again, all of these things present during lockdown and really many of them have continued since then. Um, you know, and so I, I, I know that uh, we think of natural disasters. Again, we don't have the physical destruction, but I, I, as I said, for many reasons, I believe there's still um, good information to be, to be learned here. Um, when we, when we look at our intervention planning for how to 
understand and predict how, how family violence is gonna be continue or continue to be impacted by the pandemic and our response to it. How is has family violence impacted by natural disasters? Um, well, it's not good and we'll get into that here in a minute. While there may not be a whole lot of precedent in terms of looking at global pandemics, um, when we look at natural disasters, um, they occur often. Um, at last estimates were uh, about one a day, about 364 a year. So a disaster occurs somewhere in the world every day. So again, plenty of events, unfortunately, and, and obviously a great deal of literature that looks at them. When we think of prolonged effects of natural disasters, we know that anything that was bad before the disaster only gets worse. So any you know disparities are always furthered by disaster. So again, when I think of family violence, it's no shock that it would get worse after the pandemic, because again, I, I don't think it was getting better before it. So if it was getting worse before, it even got even more worse, likely, um, right? And it makes sense that we're not spending enough resources on an issue when resources become even further limited. You know, we're probably I'm not going to be able to, to send what we need in that direction. Again, we continue to see these long-term effects and this disruption of a routine. I can't speak to the importance of routine enough, particularly for victims of family violence. I mean, it's often so key um, to them. You know, again, when we think of abuse, it's, it's the opposite of, of, of um, well, well, it's often inconsistent in terms of, um, you know, you never know what to expect or when it's going to happen. And that's why I think routines are very important for victims for their mental health. And again, when we disrupt that, close schools, close libraries, change the way we meet, things such as that, it can, it can be a big deal for, for victims of abuse. Mental health consequences are long term. We talked about disasters uh, being quick and hard hitting. They may only take an hour. It may only take a few days. Um, it may take weeks. Um, again, to, to kind of resume normal life um, when there's mass destruction. Again, it, it's even longer, I, and that's certainly true. But I'm thinking of one study in particular that noted declining mental health for up to three years following a disaster. And I think, again, it's something that we should expect um, with the pandemic. Um, all the characteristics being similar, I would expect mental health it's obviously declining. We're seeing you know, studies and reports of that already to continue to do so. So again, when we think about family violence, we think about risk factors for it. Risk only seems to be increasing even now. And so my opinion is that we will continue to see more and more family violence occurring. Um, another key thing to think about when we think about disasters is, is perpetrators are opportunistic. And so after a natural disaster, we'll see sometimes them just kind of disappear. Um, so again, in communities um, you know, where um, these disasters are, you know, hit, um, you know, if, if I often tell organizations, if there was a family or an individual you were worried about before, you should certainly be worried about them now. Um, because again, perps will, you know, they, they, they take advantage of the fact that organizations don't often work well with other organizations, um, not even from town to town, let alone county to county or state to state. So we will see perps taking families and leaving an area maybe where there were child services reports, there were other things, you know, taking that time to just kind of disappear. And, and it's very unlikely, again, that they're going to be tracked down. They'll go to a new community. And again, that community may have no, may not have any knowledge of, of what's going, of what has happened, um, you know, in the, in the past. Um, when we think about the pandemic, you know, we saw something similar in terms of schools. Um, I've talked in, and heard from many school officials that have said, you know, some of the families, you know, and, and children we were worried about when we stopped doing in-person schools, you know, um, they may or may not have had technology to continue virtually, uh, but then when we reopened them, they didn't come back. Um, and so we don't know necessarily where those kids are or what happened there. Um, so again, I, I kind of see the same thing possibly occurring in that scenario. When we think about family violence, again, obviously we want to prevent it. We don't want it to happen at all. Um, but at the very least, you know, we want to catch it, catch it early. And we want to effectively intervene to stop it, break the cycle, break the process. Um, unfortunately, um, what we note when we look at disaster and a, a family violence response is that it seems to hit the mark or miss the mark um, and fail miserably, to be honest, um, at a time probably when families need it most, right? Most of the interventions out there don't seem to help. Um, you know, when stress increases, risk for abuse increases, um, and, and particularly when it comes to the pandemic and natural disasters, um, opportunity to intervene based on kind of current intervention ideas um, seems to fail miserably. Um, look at the dramatic increases in different forms of family violence on the right there um, when disaster strikes. Um, you can see the source in the middle and the type of disaster on the left. I mean, it's important to note that, you know, these dramatic increases occur no matter what type of disaster we're looking at. Um, so again, if we think of it from that way, you know, it's not that a flood increases risk or not that a flood increases family violence or even that an earthquake does, 
but rather, in my opinion, in estimation, it's the characteristics created by the event that lead to this increase. Um, and, and just, you know, it, family violence always increases after disaster. Um, again, it's that idea that disaster furthers disparity. Um, and again, I mean, if, if it's continuing to happen, it's happened for so long, um, you would think surely it would be time to start thinking about more effective interventions. Um, I think if we had, had if we had done better at this, maybe the, the impact on family violence that the pandemic had wouldn't have been as bad because we at least would have had some sort of, of, of plan in place. But certainly now is the time to, to be more aggressive in thinking about, um, you know, again, because these, these are going to be very high risk times for these families. And if we're not effective in slowing it or stopping it again, um, you know, it's something we need to certainly focus on in the future. So I think there's value in identifying that family violence always increases after disaster. I think there's also value in, in looking at uh, specific types of disaster and what are those specific characteristics that may lead to this increase. Uh, when I think of snowstorms and looking at, at the literature, you know, we see about a, often a 100% increase in family violence. Um, when we look at earthquakes, it can be as much as 600%. And flooding, we see as about a 400% increase, just looking at the cases that exist up to those numbers. Um, so again, I, I think it's, it's, we're, we're concerned across the board, but then there's also value at looking at specific types of disasters and why is risk differ from incident to incident. Um, one of the key elements of a snowstorm or a blizzard is isolation. I think really snowstorms were the closest look at what we saw during lockdowns. You know, when you think of a snowstorm or a blizzard, you're essentially trapped with whatever resources you have um, with limited access to the outside. And, Obviously, the outside also has little access to you, um, so you're not going to be able to, to um, get to these families. Um, a lot of the same things during lockdowns, right, um, where families were cut off from the outside world and trapped with perpetrators, um, you know, the little contact with the outside and, and few resources. I think in a lot of ways, blizzards and snowstorms give us the best example of what um, lockdowns probably look like. When I think earthquake, I think aftershock. So again, you have the first major event and then you have this prolonged period where you have other events that are gonna, again, spike that trauma, bring you back to that place. I talked about it in my other presentation. Um, the, the, the length of time that you spend fearing for your life is tied um, to risk of severity for PTSD symptoms. And we're thinking aftershocks, earthquake, we're thinking continued fear, this continued state of fear, a prolonged, you know, a period where you're fearing for your life and, the, and that of others, maybe that's what, what helps increase um, that risk so exponentially for family violence. When I think of flooding, I think of more so than any other type of disaster, a disruption of routine. Um, with, with other types of disaster, you know, given obviously that your home is not destroyed or something like that um, in the event, um, it's usually only about, you know, a day or a few days maybe. Um, where, you're, where you're out of your house. Um, I think the actual estimate is closer to just a period of hours. Um, when it comes to uh, flooding or a hurricane, um, on average, it's three to five days that a family is outside of their home that we see this major disruption of routine. So again, um, I, th I think uh, that could play a role. So again, when we think about the pandemic, we see aspects of all of this in it, right? We see this idea of displacement and disruption of routine. The aftershocks, meaning, you know, continued things. Um, we, we saw that throughout the pandemic, Con continued risk. Um, you know, even after lockdowns were stopped, there was always the threat of another. We kept hearing, well, are we going to lockdown again? Is it going to happen again? And then reliving some of those things. <coughs> And then obviously the isolation that we see in a blizzard or snowstorm, obviously very present. Um, most estimates are that in, in many communities in the U.S. And, and others that, you know, domestic violence has increased by about 40 percent um, since the, the pandemic. Again, I, I'm concerned by that elevation, but in, in numbers, but again, I don't think it's a, a, an accurate look. I think that, um, you know, looking at these other rates, I think it's probably much higher. Again, victims probably still afraid to report. Um, we may continue to see that number go up, um, but I, I think it's actually looking at the natural disaster literature is probably higher than what we're seeing. So again, means reports are still being suppressed and, and victims probably still aren't reporting or haven't reported yet some of the things that, that happened during lockdown and continue to happen now. Let's look at, again, further at a, just a couple types of disasters, and some of the characteristics, because again, I think they're relevant to what we're dealing with now. When we think about DV and snowstorms, we know that there's often a significant increase. Um, but, you know, key characteristics such as isolation um, and having limited supplies play a major role. And again, these were key characteristics that we saw during lockdowns in particular. Sharing this example from a DV agency who actually had a um, 
kind of a safe house in their community for an emergency situation. They could get the family there um, while they were setting up or, or getting them to appropriate shelter. They had had an incident um, where a family was in great danger. They had to just take them to the safe house. They were dropped off there. The, um, they were actually in the house by themselves. Um, and and a, a storm that was supposed to be a rainstorm or, or at least not much snow suddenly shifted and it became a massive amount of snowfall. Um, the director of the DV program said, you know, if, if it had been, a, if something bad had happened, that being the perp had found out where they were, we couldn't have gotten there to protect them. Just this feeling again of, of being totally isolated um, and, and with outside agencies and not able to get there. Uh, many agencies felt that way about families during lockdown. I know particularly for children, I can think of many school um, officials or, or teachers that I've spoken with saying they were worried about a child. And then when lockdowns occurred, um, obviously they had no way to get to that child um, and became even more concerned. Um, and, and again, feeling that, that they had lost opportunity there to be able to detect and, and to, to try to ensure their safety. You may not have many volcanic eruptions where you, where you live, but I think there's still some key characteristics here that are interesting to look at. We see a major increase in DV after a volcanic eruption. Um, and again, I think there's a prolonged period here, right? You have this uh, major, you have this anticipation of the eruption. So the mountain may be giving off signs that it's about to erupt. Um, you may be seeing things that say that, hey, it's coming. Again, you see that stress start to increase. You have the major event. And then we often see additional disasters such as flooding and things such as that after the eruption. So again, you have this prolonged period where you're afraid, where you're feeling stress, where your response, the stress response is elevated. Again, I, I think that can attribute to why we see DV increase so much after these events. Uh, what's scary is, is when DV increases after a volcanic eruption, as it does, um, it doesn't ever come back generally to normal. That elevated rate becomes the new normal. Again, I think it speaks to the prolonged period of stress. And when again, when I go to the pandemic, I see it as a disaster in slow motion, sometimes what, what these types of, of events are like. And so I get concerned when I see that it never comes back, but rather creates a new normal. And I become very worried that these elevated rates of DV and family violence won't come back down just as they don't after these types of events, but would rather stay in this elevated state. This idea again of a new normal being created. We've talked about how disaster um, often leads to an increase in family violence, how specific forms of disaster um, can lead to an increase. And now let's talk about specific disasters and look at it from that perspective as well, which I think can be helpful. I'm gonna speak again for about uh, another 35 minutes or so, and at least stop about um, 15 minutes early uh, to allow in case there's any questions or, or time for anything like such as that. When we look at Hurricane Katrina, obviously uh, most um, here in the US are aware uh, massive destruction there on the on the coast, uh, particularly Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Um, when we look at its impact of, on family violence, well, we note a 98% increase in, in one study that looked at physical victimization among women in southern Mississippi. And this remained for six months after. And it remained for six months after uh, because the study was six months after. So it might have also been the same case a year after and two years after. Again, as I said, these these you know, rates of these things increase and they usually stay there for a period of time. Um, it was unchanged for men in terms of physical victimization, at least in terms of what was reported. When we looked at psychological abuse, um, we saw the increase um, again, more affecting apparent or appearing to affect women greater, but also seeing um, some effect there on men. Again, I think important to note though, seeing this increase and knowing that it stayed there for a prolonged period of time. Um, nearly half of the population with PTSD, again, when you think about fearing for one's life and, and, and things such as that in the prolonged period, um, determining the most severe symptoms of PTSD, a, a destructive event like this, it's not surprising that many you know, would experience those types of events and, and from the trauma um, and, and probably for quite some time after the event. When we look at the snowstorm disaster you see there in 2006, again, looking at a specific event, um, we know that there was a loss of electricity and telephone for three weeks and that the rural areas, as they are in many public health issues, were disproportionately impacted. Again, it goes back to the idea that disparities are further through disaster. And so in specific areas of the community where, where we're seeing already, um, you know, a, a disproportionate representation of, of harmful or negative health outcomes, it's only going to get worse when disaster strikes. Roads closed for one week. So again, no telephone, no electricity. Roads closed again, I think it speaks to high stress and cut off from the outside world. Very much like lockdowns, um, we just see this idea of, of agencies can't get to you. 
um, and, and you're trapped. Perps know that they're opportunistic. I think risk for abuse went very high during this time. Interestingly, there were a few cases reported of DV at the onset of the disaster. But if you go up to line one there, you'll remember that telephone was at, those telephones were out um, for three weeks. And what's interesting was as soon as phones were restored, we immediately started to see reports double. You know, it gets back to this idea, you can't report abuse if you can't report abuse. And much the same as it was during lockdowns, you know, it, when, you know when we think about reporting of domestic violence, it, it usually comes from the adult victim themselves. And if they're trapped with an abuser, it's certainly not going to feel safe making that call. So again, you can't report it if you can't report it. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, here's one I thought that I actually had something a little different. So I talked about disaster um, always furthers disparity. Family violence always increases after a natural disaster. This one appeared to be different. Um, and again, um, what I noted um, looking at this particular tornado disaster there in Texas was a study that said no increase in calls reporting DV to police. Um, now, this is important, right? Because if, if that's accurate, then we need to bottle it. We got to figure out what they did and we got to get it out there because DV always increases after disaster. What was different about this community? I dug into it a little deeper. And in this community at the time, you see that the population there, interestingly, no DV shelters in community. Something else I've noted, I think, in, in some of the communities I've looked at around the pandemic, that while phones may have gone quiet reporting DV during lockdowns. Once lockdowns were lifted, we saw more calls coming in. Um, not always the case in some communities that don't have shelters. Um, we never really saw the calls come in, or at least they didn't increase. Um, and again, that kind of makes sense if you don't have a plan in place of what, uh, a clear plan in place of what people should do if they experience these things before disaster strikes. It's even less likely that they're just going to blindly trust you when disaster strikes, right? Um, again, we have to have these things in place before. Interestingly, too, as I dug deeper into the local media reports, I found a, a church in the area that actually, you know, uh, this academic study says DV did not increase. But this church said, well, um, you know, there was enough church leaders in the area that were concerned and they came forward and the newspaper article reads that these church pastors were worried because they were hearing an increasing reports of domestic violence um, four to five months after the tornado. Again, that falls in line with what the other data seems to show. Um, interestingly, too, when I was giving this presentation in a Texas community, one of the officers that was in the room actually was involved um, in this tornado. And he said, you know, you're, you're right on the money there. DV did increase. Um, what happened was, um, and this often happens with disasters, because law enforcement was so busy, um, you know, their own homes were destroyed and they were helping in other ways with the community. Local or, or nearby departments were taking over certain cases. And so they had one local police department that took, or, or a nearby police department that took all the DV calls. So again, if you're doing this research study and you just looked at calls to the Lancaster police or whatever, you would not see that report, that increase in DV, it would have looked similar or even gone down. But the reality is reports were coming in, they were just being outsourced to a different department. Always a good reminder when we're you know, doing studies and things to talk to the community we're working in and thinking about those things. Because again, kind of misleading when they say that it didn't increase. In fact, it did. Um, it just was being collected by a nearby police department who was helping in the event. Um, again, I think it's something important to point out because when we think about natural disaster, <coughs> excuse me, let me get another drink. When we think about natural disasters, we often see outside community agencies coming in to help to provide assistance because many of the local community agencies are dealing probably with disaster in their own home and their own family. They need that help. Again, when we think about the pandemic, you know, where's outside help going to come from? You know, in this case, everyone was impacted by it. Um, and so there really is no place to be able to get that outside help. I talk often about pets and they certainly play a role when it comes to the disaster literature and the pandemic as well. Uh, pets are, are, are critical to the humans that they're connected to always, but particularly um, in, in situations where um, disaster or, or crisis or, or harm um, is occurring. You can see here, um, even from the earliest um, recorded um, history a, a around disaster, um, this is from the mummif this is mummified remains from the um, eruption of, of Mount Vesuvius in the Pompeii area there. Um, on the left, you can see a dog with a collar, um, likely attached to a pole or, or something at the time of the uh, eruption. On the right, you can see a, a child clutching a small dog. Um, again, even from the earliest recorded literature on natural disasters, um, we see animals and, and humans dealing with these types of things together. 
a quote I think that was pretty impactful that, that comes from literature in this area. Vulnerable people may be reluctant to evacuate without their animals. They may decline emergency accommodation if their animal is unwelcome, and they may struggle more than others to cope with recovery and rebuilding without them. I mean, how relevant, again, after a disaster, but also just true in, with family violence in general, how dependent uh, humans are on these animals for support, particularly when things get more and more difficult. Given that more than half the population own pets, there's arguably more risk in not helping people to safely accommodate animals in their emergency plans. Um, again, um, I think a very relevant and, and accurate statement um, that, again, speaks to not only after natural disaster and, and disasters that incur, occur in the environment, um, but also disasters that obviously that occur um, within the walls of the home. And when we think about family violence and things such as that. Further thinking about pets and natural disasters, um, we know that, that um, at least before the Pets Act, it was considered the greatest barrier to human evacuation, not accounting for pets in the process. I mean, sounds familiar when I talk about family violence, it's still uh, what most claim to be one of the greatest barriers. Um, and it was just the same with natural disasters as well. When you flip that, you can make it a protective factor, meaning you know, if, if you don't include pets in the process, people aren't gonna leave them behind. They'll stay in face of a disaster, just like they'll stay in face abuse and, and, and deal with it. Um, but when you can flip it and say, you know, um, we have a safe place for your pets and, you know, your pet's not going to be safe in a tornado or in a hurricane or a flood or whatever's coming. So why don't you get them to safety and why don't you come too, right? We could do the same thing with family violence if we included it and say, hey, your pet's probably going to become a target of the abuser for their own safety. You need to get out of that home. And, and you know, again, that protects the humans connected to the pet too. Um, looking at even um, fatalities in, in Australia during the time period you see there, um, one in 10 um, from a long period of time there, um, one in 10 of the fatalities around the flooding were relating to trying to save a pet. And in some cases, even if it wasn't their own pet, uh, again, a, a first responder or something, someone trying to save um, someone else's pet um, dying in the process. Again, a, a major barrier to safety um, for disasters, as well as, again, in, in homes where disaster occurs within the walls of the home. This changed um, after Hurricane Katrina. Um, this particular story caught a lot of national attention. Um, and, and what was occurring here, it was about Snowball, um, the, the white dog you see pictured there. Um, in this particular instance, um, again, it was Hurricane Katrina. They were um, taking buses of people to different places uh, for safety. A lot of them went to New Orleans to the Superdome there. Um, and I don't know if that's where this bus was headed. I assume probably. Um, but in this particular case, a 14-year-old or 13-year-old, I think he was, he had been separated from his family. He, they just found him just by himself clutching his small white dog, Snowball, there. Um, when he got to the bus to, to be taken somewhere to safety, um, there was no planning for pets. And so uh, many people on the bus took pictures, video um, of the child being separated from this animal. They took the animal from him, got him on the bus. Um, you know, again, the, 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 you think about what that pet meant to that child probably all the time, but what about then, again, when it's all they had, like that was their emotional support. Caused a lot of national attention. Um, there was many searches to try to locate the boy or the dog. Um, at one point, they thought they had found them, but it turned out not to be the case. Um, neither were ever located, so we don't know what happened to the pair. But again, heartbreaking to think of that separation and, and, and what that probably meant. Studies find that, again, after a disaster, um, if, if separated, um, and particularly for separation from a pet, you're going to see an increased risk for the things you see there, both now and in the future. Again, those sounds so much like what happens with family violence, and again, speaks to the importance of including pets in this process. 2006, at least for natural disasters, things changed with the Pets Act that uh, provided funding. Um, that would allow people to be able to safely evacuate with their animals. Um, so this would provide money so that communities can include pets in the process. And it made a big difference. Um, this is Hurricane, I think it's Hurricane Floyd. Um, it was in the Houston area that the story had described by the Washington Post details. Um, and, and according to the story, there at the convention center, I believe it was in Houston. Um, the first day there was no planning included for pets and people were lining up as the rain was coming down and the hurricane approaching and they were staying outside, just feet from safety, but they would not come inside if they couldn't bring that animal with them. Um, thanks to the Pets Act, funding was available. And so the next day the doors were open to pets. They were able to create and accommodate that. And guess what? When the pets came in, the people connected to them did too. Um, and it just, again, shows the importance of including pets, not just protect them, but protect the people connected to them too. I, I uh, published then a follow-up study um, to the initial study looking at that pandemic where I looked at actual data and, and looked at how family violence was impacted. And I'll share some of that information with you now. When it comes to reporting of domestic violence, this was um, data from a community in Southern Indiana. 
you see in blue, 2019, um, and then in 2020 in, in orange there, particularly during the months of lockdown, you see that decrease from March to June uh, before the um, numbers started to come back up. I've kind of noted that same trend in a lot of communities, um, where at least to law enforcement, we saw kind of a decrease in reports um, throughout lockdown. Again, when we think about the report source, it's not shocking. Adults report uh, domestic violence themselves um, often. Uh, so if they're trapped with a perpetrator during a lockdown, you know, it's not going to be safe to do that. I can think of instances where individuals tried to and were at high risk of, of being killed and fortunate to, to have survived. Um, but then we see those numbers come up as, as they're able to separate from that abuser, get a safe space where they can make the call. Um, you know, it, again, when we see that dip of in, in non-fatal incidents being reported of domestic violence, um, again, I don't think it's an accurate representation of what actually happened because look what happened to the homicide numbers during that same period. Um, and if fatal incidents are increasing so, ex, you know, so significantly, it really doesn't make sense to me that non-fatal incidents wouldn't also be going up. So again, when we see that drop in DV reports, I don't think it's an, an accurate indicator that DV was going down, but rather that it just wasn't safe to report it. When we look at natural disaster literature, we not only see that, um, again, that, that domestic violence increases, it just in general in incidents, but it also increases in severity. So look at the strangulation numbers um, there. Um, this was post Harvey there on the right. And that's just as of July uh, 2017, you see that the entire year number there and the study was done in July. So even just halfway through the year, you look at um, how much greater it had already occurred than, than the prior year. Um, and again, um, likely to have continued. The study was done there in the middle of the year. So I'm sure it, it probably likely went up even greater, obviously, from there. Um, again, so not only just an increase in incidents, but an increase in severity. Again, something I think we've witnessed during the lockdown or during the pandemic and we'll continue to see, unfortunately. Another way um, the lockdown and, and the pandemic impacted family violence was the court systems. We saw major changes in the courts, obviously, related to the pandemic. One of the big ones was the release of, of prisoners. Again, the, the concern that, um, that the pandemic was being spread within prisons. So we saw sentences reduced, sentences commuted, um, in some cases, dangerous um, criminals being released. Um, in this particular case, um, a, a domestic violence perpetrator um, had um, attacked the woman you see pictured here with a hammer. It would, would be considered obviously a, assault with a deadly weapon. You would hope would have carried um, some more significant jail time with that. It was during the pandemic, during a lot of those concerns about spreading the virus um, in these homes that the um, that the incident occurred. Um, the perpetrator spent very little time in jail and within a month had returned and, and killed his, his girlfriend. Um, again, I can think of many examples of similar types of situations. And again, it goes back to the idea of, of, of ensuring, you know, it's, it's good to have our mind on, on the pandemic and thinking about what are we doing to slow the spread of the virus. Uh, but if we forget risks and, and other issues in the process, um, really bad things can happen. Um, we also saw an increase in risk for officers, in my estimation, when responding to incidents during the pandemic, and we'll continue to see that elevated um, into the future, in, in my opinion. Here's an officer, unfortunately, here in Indianapolis that was shot and killed while responding to domestic violence um, there again during the pandemic. We talked about um, adult victims uh, reporting most of domestic violence. Interestingly, when we look at who reports child abuse, um, we see it's most often schools, and then we see the other agencies you see listed there. Again, when we think back to the pandemic, um, many of these agencies had limited contact with children, limited opportunity to report and detect. So I think that helps explain why we see this, dips, this dip in child abuse reporting as well. Um, just as we saw the, the same dip in domestic violence reporting, we, saw, we see it in, in child abuse reporting. Um, over those same months where lockdowns were occurring. Again, if outside agencies report child abuse and they have limited contact with children, I don't so much as believe that abuse stopped as it wasn't being reported. Um, we also see then, um, you know, the, the line never comes back quite to where it was the year before. We see that orange line stay below blue. So even after lockdowns were lifted, um, we still didn't necessarily see the reports come back um, to where they were before. We, see, we saw this in many other states, that information I just shared was from my home state of Indiana, but we saw other drops right in, in, in states and um, across the US um, during the periods of lockdown. While we were seeing this drop in non-fatal incidents though, we had, inc we had organizations such as you see the, the um, news report here saying that while non-fatal incidents were going down, they were, many agencies were seeing a dramatic increase in fatal and severe incidents that required hospitalization. 
Um, so again, I think it's always important to note, just like DV, we saw reports go down, but we saw homicides go up. And we saw in child abuse, we saw reports go down. And in many communities, um, homicides or, um, and um, severe cases go up. So again, as I said, there's no reason to believe non-fatal wouldn't progress with fatal. Um, and so I, I, my concern again is that these incidents were occurring with high frequency, high severity, um, and just weren't being reported because the people who generally report um, didn't have access to these families or, or at least restricted access. As I noted, the, the CDC eventually um, did cite my paper and their official recommendation to reopen schools. And again, I think it, uh, if schools are the ones reporting abuse and we don't have any plan in place um, to cover for that, again, that's a, there's many reasons why children need to be in physical schools, I think, in terms of learning and quality of education, things such as that. Again, not speaking to, not wanting to increase risk for teachers and things like that. Uh, but again, understanding when it's safe to do so, we needed to get these kids back into school. Um, and the CDC and, and their official recommendation to do so did cite that that predictive paper that I wrote. Um, we've seen even recently physicians continue to describe this growing mental health concern among kids. Again, like I said, if you're looking at the natural disaster literature, it's not a surprise. Um, we see this declining mental health usually lasts three years. In some cases, I think even five, if I remember one paper right. Um, so again, something to note that it's probably not going to get better anytime soon outside of an effective um, intervention to, to really look at these types of things. So I talked about the decline in domestic violence reports and child abuse reports. Now, what do you think happened to animal abuse reports during the lockdown? Um, interestingly, we don't see the same dip. Um, and so while child abuse went down in terms of reporting and then DV went down in reporting, um, animal abuse stayed the same. And this again is a reason why I say that I don't believe that DV and child abuse really did go down. Um, I just think the opportunities to detect and report were limited. Um, why did animal abuse not go down would be a question to think about. Um, and, and my estimate or my reason for it is that, uh, again, report source. Adults, adults report uh, domestic violence themselves. Um, outside agencies report child abuse, um, but it's neighbors who report animal abuse. Um, my study noted about 89% of the time. So again, when we think about a lockdown scenario, neighbors were even more likely to be in their home. Um, and, and still had great opportunities to detect and report and continue to do so. So I think it's just a good reminder and the importance of, of combining efforts between human welfare and animal welfare, you know, um, in cases like this where we have limited opportunity to detect these types of things. Um, you know, neighbors don't historically report uh, domestic violence or child abuse. Only, I think it's about 12% of child abuse reports come from a neighbor and only 8% of DV reports come from a neighbor. Um, but again, almost 90% of animal cruelty comes from a neighbor. So again, if we're ever in a scenario like that, again, where outside agencies have limited contact, thinking about natural disasters too, um, a good time to include, um, you know, uh, to understand that the animal cruelty data is, is even more important. If we're getting animal cruelty reports, but not getting reports of child abuse and domestic violence, um, you know, probably even of greater importance to think about when we're getting that call from a neighbor talking about animal cruelty saying well is there any concern that you have for humans in the home too um, you know because again neighbors don't historically report the other types of things but they might be willing to do so if we ask them when they are reporting the one type of abuse that they typically do report I'm kind of seeing this continue this trend so in another community that i'm working in now um, you can see there from 2019 to 2021 we, we see DV up there and this reports to police, um, as I said, it kind of went down initially, but then ended up going up in 2020 and then up again this year or last year. What about when uh, law enforcement's involved in CPS assist? We saw that um, go down in 2020 and stay down in 2021. So those numbers really have not come back up. So again, the question becomes, is abuse really going away? Well, when I see DV going up, it's hard for me to believe it because I know children are at 60 times the risk in a home where DV occurs. So I get more concerned again about the idea that is, is abuse really going down or is it just not being reported? Um, and I'm concerned about that a lot. Um, again, animal cruelty not as affected, right? We see it kind of remaining steady again because I think the report source wasn't affected um, as much. Um, but again, something that I think is important to note that that uh, maybe those cases and calls aren't as impacted as much when these types of events occur. What are some things that we can take away or learn from this? I'm going to finish in the next 15 minutes or so, and then I'll, I'll stick around, obviously, and allow time for questions. So what, how do we learn? What do we learn? What do we take away? Well, the obvious thing that I've taken away from the pandemic is the need for new partners. Um, you know, obviously, we know these issues are massive. Um, they involve many different angles and many different things. I mean, partners are, are limited, right? And so we need all the help we can get. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that. 
and it's important that we're including all these partners in our efforts. Um, and so uh, I, I think casting a wider net was important um, then and it remains important. Um, sometimes I, I talk about, I think in my own life and, and when I think about this work professionally, you know, we need to focus not on what we don't have, but rather what can we do with what we do have. And so during lockdowns in particular, obviously I talked about um, outside agencies having limited access to these homes, but there were definitely agencies that still did have access. So mail was still being delivered, um, home repair was still occurring, garbage collections still happening, food pickups and food delivery still occurring. Again, I, I worked with um, a couple of agencies in particular and around the idea of, of trying to, to reach these agencies and say, hey, we have limited opportunity to detect abuse right now. I mean, the ask has to be simple and realistic. So. <laughs> excuse me, just providing a card and saying, hey, if, <coughs> if you see something occurring, you know, please consider or, or please report it. And, and the card showing like who to call, what to do, things such as that. Um, and that can be huge in these types of events. Um, and so I know that at least from one uh, reach out in particular that the agency was, was very interested and willing um, to take that information and share it with their staff. So again, thinking about casting a wider net, many of these um, agencies are, are in neighborhoods and around homes um, you know, every day, and they might already have families they're worried about. So even just approaching them and saying, hey, um, would you be uh, willing to, to be a part of this? And, and in terms of just, if you see something reporting it, again, we're not asking them to be a hero, not asking them to run in the house. I mean, they are being a hero when they report it, but we're not asking them to take the matter in their own hands, but rather to report it to the proper agency. And then also trying to engage neighbors better. Like I said, they report animal cruelty. So at the very least, when they report animal cruelty, we need to ask them if they're worried about humans in the home too. Uh, but also getting them to, to report domestic violence and child abuse, because even just given proximity, there, there probably are many more neighbors who are aware of those types of things, but aren't reporting. You know, Maybe they're concerned for their own safety. Maybe they don't understand the process. Um, but again, something that we need to work on better engaging neighbors and reporting abusive humans. Other things I learned is you know when we looked at the pandemic, uh, we saw, um, or, or the medical response to it, we saw many hotels offering, you know, free places for uh, medical providers to, to stay so that they could safely um, be quarantined away from their family while working in a hospital. Um, I also thought, you know, that it would be interesting and, and it would be helpful to do that for DV shelters too. Many DV shelters were at capacity, particularly during lockdowns, um, and uh, many hotels sat empty in our communities. And, you know, a hotel would be a great space because many of them are even pet friendly. And so DV victims could bring their pets. They would be in their own area. So safely quarantined from other families. Again, obviously, the victim uh, safety is paramount. So we want to make sure we do it anonymously. So we, we're not just broadcasting, um, you know, that, that there's certain hotels or whatever. We'd want to obviously be smart about that. Um, but eventually, finally, um, later on in the pandemic, um, and I know the pandemic obviously is still going on, but I'm thinking about later in 2020 and on to early 2021, um, we started seeing um, some of these like some of these partnerships starting to occur where some of the hotels were understanding that DV shelters were at capacity. And we did start to see that happen again, something I think it's important to remember uh, utilizing spaces like that, finding ways to safely do it again can be life saving for these families. Um, I share one example. This was in a rural environment. It was a victim who shared, you know, when we think about, again, the idea of turning negatives into positives, when we think about a rural environment, sometimes that long driveway can be a problem um, because uh, it gives perpetrators of abuse opportunity to know that someone's coming long before they ever get to their house. You know, if, if, if there's street access and it's far away from the home, you know, they can, they can, um, you know, have an idea that someone's coming, it can allow them to, to stop whatever they're doing, cover their tracks, destroy evidence, do whatever. Um, again, particularly if it's a long gravel driveway, they're going to hear it, they may see it. Um, so um, how do we turn that into a positive? Well, well one uh, victim described who resided in a rural environment during the lockdown, she said that the farthest distance she was able to get from the perpetrator was while she was getting the mail. Um, that it was a long driveway. And so her walk to the mailbox was the farthest she was ever away from him. She didn't, couldn't have her phone. He had kept that from her. There was no real way to call for help. But she said, you know, if there had been something I could safely put on my mailbox that was kind of nondiscreet um, or that was um, nondescript, that was discreet, that no one would just obviously know what I was doing, then maybe the mail carrier could have seen that and called the authorities because it, 
indicate something's wrong in the home. So again, I, I think it's something you'd have to have in place before disaster strikes and you'd want to make it. I'm not going to say what the specific thing she said to put on there was because it would be a decision you'd make in your own community and you would handle it in the way obviously that perpetrators aren't going to know um, that it's there. But you know, if you're working with a domestic violence shelter and you have families you're worried about, um, if disaster is approaching, if something is approaching, like thinking about talking through that um, and ensuring the postal service knows that if they see that marker, um, that they know to call a certain number might be a way to save lives in those types of environments as well. Texting, another big one. Again, if it's not safe to make a phone call and report abuse or domestic violence during these times and incidents, you know, texting can be life-saving. Um, some communities have these options, but it's important to make sure that the community is aware of them. Um, also could be life-saving for children too. Again, if you're trapped with a perpetrator of abuse, if you're, you know, um, transient traveling from a disaster for whatever reason, having that texting option, again, could be life-saving. It's not gonna be safe to make that voice call but being able to text and a need for help could, could again be huge in saving lives. Other things I've learned in working through the process, again, is the importance of schools. They, they report abuse often. Um, again, they have a lot, you know, children sometimes say, you know, school is the only place they're safe. And so maybe that's why they disclose it. They're actually an opportunity where they're, um, you know, have, feel safe to do so. Uh, many of them, we, we see children from abusive home environments even falling asleep in the classroom because again, it's the one time their, their body feels safe to be able to relax and allow that rest to come. I think we, we need to expand our work with schools, and I think school bus drivers are, are something that we don't often include in our planning, but if you think about it, a bus driver would be the, the first person to see a child before they leave, potentially an abusive environment, and the last person to see them before they go back. So when we think about children, obviously, that are dealing with abuse, they don't often know how to describe it or how to talk about it. They may be acting out behaviorally, though, so understanding that 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 it, school bus drivers really could be a good resource. And I think something we need to work further at. Um, churches, again, I, I know um, um, have great opportunity to provide support. Um, we saw families cut off from churches and that, that really did um, um, impact, I think, these issues. Uh, many family uh, violence victims that rely heavily on support because they're not getting it at home, obviously. And the support from the church can be, again, life-saving, life-altering. Um, we also know I can think of some cases in rural environments where close-knit communities that perps allow victims to go to church because it would look suspicious, right? If they didn't, um, perps sometimes take pride in, 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 particularly if they're good mask wearers, not pandemic mask, but I mean, the idea of a theater mask where an individual is, is, is abusive in the home, but appears different in the community. We see this happening frequently, I believe. Um, and, and many take pride in, in being able to do this type of essentially play acting at church. It's another layer of trauma for the victim to see them so, the perpetrator of abuse so well liked, so well received at church. Um, again, it, it kind of undermines that support and security the victim may be able to find at church. And just again, makes them feel furtherly hopeless. This idea that um, you know no one would believe them, um, that there's nowhere that they can get help and safety. Um, again, I think abusers do that often. For me, as I said, Shelby and my dog, you know, is, it was life-saving for me. I know I certainly struggled with suicide um, and, and, and close to ending my life. And it was always his still steady voice that, that um, got me through. Um, I think, again, including animal welfare and the efforts is critical after disaster um, throughout the pandemic, I mean, ongoing, um, you know, and, and so I always speak to, again, renewing these relationships between human welfare and animal welfare um, in your community, I think is, is just, uh, you know, the best approach um, to, again, ensuring we protect all in these homes. You can't protect any in the home if you don't protect all in the home. Um, I, I shared uh, earlier in my other talk, but I, I wrote a book on this piece that's available on Amazon, an ebook, or, or in any other type of place where books are sold, where I look further at the, the importance of pets to, to these families. There's my contact info. Um, uh, I think many, I, I know, I don't think we have a, a whole lot watching live um, now, but I, I assume that we may have some watching the recording. So here's, here's a way to reach out to me um, um, through different forms of media there, as well as my email. Um, any of the studies that I've shared today in this presentation or in the keynote one I delivered or in the breakfast um, fundraiser for Safe Passage yesterday, um, all of my studies are available for free. If you go to campbellresearchandconsulting.com, you can click on the research tab and I make sure any of the, the papers or, or studies that I write are available for free download there. Um, but thank you very much again for your time and attention. Um, I was told to stop just a little early so that we can allow a time in case any questions do come in. So um, if, if you are listening and do have a question, if you could um, just type that in the chat box or you can even just uh, unmute your mic and, and speak it out loud and I'll, I'll, I'm allowing time or have time now to, to answer those. So I'll go ahead and, and pause and, and wait and see if we have any come in.
Hi, Andrew. It's Stephanie. I'll, I'll go first. Yes. Hey, Stephanie. Hi. Um, I, I hope I can explain this. Well, I'm still processing from yesterday and now processing everything we just heard that you just told us about. So still, it's all still up here, but I do have a question. Yes. And you might have an answer for it. Or it might just be, I have to think about that. And maybe in the future you'd have an answer, but because um, my thought, you know, after hearing your presentation just now and also all of our familiarity around the lack of or the dip in, you know, for example, uh, child abuse reports going down during COVID um, and not at the same time seeing some of those trends happen with um, other abuse reports. Um, and I guess for me, also looking at, for example, the pie chart that you showed, neighbors um, very likely to report animal abuse. Um, and we know at the same time, neighbors sometimes very unlikely to report child abuse. Correct. And um, do you have a sense of, or maybe this is just a gut feeling, maybe there isn't data around it, that because of how important the relationship is between a, um, a person and their pet, that perhaps... Perhaps people do have this like this universal love for animals that they don't necessarily have, maybe for for children. Do you so, see what I'm I do, and so I, I think it's a fair question. I've certainly thought through this, um, mm -hmm. and so I certainly I mean I don't have an answer. Like you know, obviously we can't. We'd have to go and ask everyone. Yeah. Every, you know, why are you reporting? <laughs> so again, yeah. it's just speaking from my own perceptions and thoughts. Um, sure. I think that's certainly true. I think. I, I mean, I think there's other things that you, we can look at. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. opportunity might be greater because pets are probably more likely to be outside um, mm -hmm. and not with other humans around, you know, particularly, I think that's the same during the pandemic. If the family was trapped in the home, mm -hmm. you know, then, then the pets probably aren't going to be outside. I mean, particularly if it's like significant or severe physical abuse, you right. know, abusers probably not going to let a child just run around the neighborhood, right? Um, they're going to keep them inside. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a pet, they may not think of it as being as obvious. Mm -hmm. um, I also wonder too about the if people understand the link between animal cruelty and severe mm -hmm. risk for humans, mm -hmm. and so they might see that animal and are reporting because for whatever reason in their estimation the risk to themselves is lower mm -hmm. than if they were to so like if I see child abuse and report it, I'm wondering well what about my own kids? You know I have children like is this person going to come for them? Or if I'm reporting domestic violence and I, you know it's a it's a violent human acting violently to another human with a weapon with something like mm -hmm. that, well do I really want to report that because then they're going to be coming to my door? You know I mm -hmm. think a lot of people struggle to trust the idea that it's really going to be anonymous mm -hmm. when they report domestic violence or child abuse, mm -hmm. and so I think that's an important thing that we have to make yeah. sure communities understand that no like we are going to respect that that it is going to be anonymous that you can make an anonymous report now we mm -hmm. would rather them not make it anonymous because we'd like to be able to follow up and get more information and things such as that so it's better when it's not uh, but i think understanding that you know could be helpful mm -hmm. um i don't know you know i don't know i i've thought through what you're thinking i don't know if it's necessarily that i will say though however um, it, it's also like kind of a step away. Like, and so I think for some people, like child abuse is just too hard to even think about. And in mm -hmm. my own work, they just kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. Like they kind of glaze over, you can see it. And it's not that necessarily that they don't care. It's just mm -hmm. like, it's too much. Like, I can't yeah. think about a child. I, you know, I think, and then, well, I have a grandchild. I, you know, they think like they can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but pet abuse, like, again, they have a relationship with an animal. They may be able to more likely go there. I'm just, that's, yeah. I mean, this is all just me, you know, it's kind of yeah. throwing things out that I've thought through. Um, yeah, but I think, I, I think understanding it's important because again, mm -hmm. they will report it. So they mm -hmm. will report something. It's not like they won't report anything. Neighbors mm -hmm. are reporting this. Mm -hmm. So it's finding out why so that we can help then. Cause I mean, at, we, we work with what we've got. So now they report animal abuse. We say, are you concerned about humans? But ideally we would also get them to report abuse of humans. Cause there's going to be homes yes. where there are no pets. So right. um, I think I, it's certainly something I'm thinking about and, and looking at, cause I think it's important to understand the why as, which is, mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent question that you're asking. Thank you. Yeah. And I just, um, I was just interested in your perspective. I mean, like, maybe and probably isn't an answer to it this morning, but it's something that has been on my mind for a long time. I think ever since I started working with Safe Passage and also 
um, just following everything that you know Rich is writing about and we're studying that that's yep. definitely been on my mind and I never I didn't really I haven't like quite pinned it you know yet if it's like originally I thought well maybe it's maybe it's more of a cultural thing or you know if it's more it could be I think I think that plays a I think that plays yeah. a role too I think it's a good point culture too and mm -hmm. and also you know maybe you know they maybe who knows I mean the, the neighbor may not report because they've been a victim themselves or they're a perpetrator themselves but animals mm -hmm. have a, you know who knows like um, but again, that's why I said, at least until we figure it out, we got to work with what we've got. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're willing to report on animals. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's why we have to make sure we have animal agencies and a dedicated response. So definitely. Definitely. Okay. And well, that's, thank you. Yeah. That study on the, that I reported the neighbors thing on the animal cruelty has only been out for three months and I couldn't find it anywhere else in the literature, or anything reporting that. So I think, mm -hmm. oh, you know, or maybe I wrote it four months ago. So kind of a new that I expect that we'll see more stuff coming out in that area so also hoping to see you know other follow-up studies and things that can help too with answering some of those questions so mm -hmm. could, could you see the possibility of in the future maybe this is happening somewhere in the country and you're already aware of it but um you know more of like if the research is informing practice if you would ever see um perhaps an agency or an organization sort of opening its doors and saying you know we accept all abuse reports and then we take them down and, you know, they come through this big front door and then we can let them trickle down to whichever um, organizations or entities can help in that situation, you know, like a universal abuse reporting system. I would love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I would love that. Unfortunately, yeah. and that's something I talk a little bit about in my book and a lot of my work is uh, agencies don't tend to work well together in these areas. Yeah. The problem is people, a lot of agencies are extremely territorial about these issues. Uh, mm -hmm. The reality is, is there's plenty of them to go around. Um, there's no reason, you know, unfortunately, I don't say that like flippantly, like it's just a reality. Mm -hmm. Abuse in all forms is, in my opinion, occurring, you know, I mean, it's, it, but, but we still see that we still see and, and you know, we can see that some fields maybe or some areas more than others but a very mm -hmm. kind of protective like you know this is my issue this is our issue no one else should see it no one else should know it and again i understand that to the point where we're wanting to protect victims and their identities that should always be paramount mm -hmm. but when in terms of best practice i think what you're describing would provide greater oversight certainly um, it would provide a, a better way to ensure that um you know that um First of all, what information is coming in, um, you know, because again, we, we want to protect the victims um, throughout the process, but we also want to ensure they're getting the proper services and that the mm -hmm. response is correct. And if agencies can, you know, withhold that and some of them can and kind of keep it to themselves and maybe share some things, maybe not like, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to see it. I just think of that when I think about realistically, I don't know, because there's so many agencies that I think would put up a fight. Um, mm -hmm. And that's concerning. You would hope that and I don't, again, there's good agencies out there, but you would mm -hmm. hope that you would hope it's, it would always be the well-being of the family that would be paramount. Uh, but sometimes yes. I, I, sometimes I wonder um, with some agencies that I do deal with again, not mm -hmm. all of them and there's many good ones, uh, but, but some it make me wonder. So I think it would probably be dependent on the community and, 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 and some of those types of pieces too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would think that the, like you said, some agencies, if they're difficult to work with, I mean, the agencies are still powered by, by humans and, we are limited in some some regards, right? Because of our right. opinions about situations or cultural, you know, drawbacks are there, yep. and so we we're limited. Or we can't quite like if we had some kind of universal reporting system or you know a big front door. Yep, I think it would protect against some of the biases too that happen. So I yep. I would love to see it, but uh, <laughs> you know, but you'd have to get everyone to agree that protecting the family was paramount and. Yes. Some agencies I don't, or I should say, I should say protecting victims is paramount. Okay. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure that um, some are, are there yet. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, I'll keep thinking about this. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate no, good. you sharing your ideas. Matt. Yeah. And anything I can do to help in the process, because I think, yeah, I would love to see something in that area. Um, mm -hmm. And it should be. It's just, you know, figuring out how to overcome some of those obstacles that. It's not like there aren't already enough obstacles in this area. Like it's, right. I mean, there's nothing easy about fighting against abuse and try. I mean, there's literally nothing easy about it. So when you have unnecessary obstacles, sometimes and in some cases are necessary. Again, I know there's legal things, legal protections, things like that. But sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like we add extra barriers that you know um, are just kind of people getting in the way of of, mm -hmm. of trying of other people who want to help. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mm -hmm. agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. That was a good question. Yeah. yeah um, 
I guess I should open it up. Um, does anyone else have a, a question for Andrew? Um, we have a few minutes left uh, and I have to send a message to the whole party here. So um, I'll just I'll be quiet for about 30 seconds while I type that. But if anyone else has a question for Andrew, I just have to do this one quick. And again, if you don't have a question now, again, you've got my contact info there, so feel free to um, email that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I sent my message. Does everyone? Oh, Karen. Karen says, excellent presentation. I agree. Thank you. This was, Thank this you was fabulous. And we have a recording of it as well, Andrew. So. Um, Folks will be able to access that later. And I'll probably be watching it again. And oh, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I did any the studies on the pandemic, anything, like I said, if, if you can see that I should have put the website on there, but if they just go to my, you know, it, all of it is, is there for free. And the pandemic papers in particular are even open access. So even if you just Google, probably, um, you know, you probably, uh, you know, yeah, you can find them all for free there too. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Well, it snowed here this morning, Andrew. So you get out of town for some time. <laughs> That's amazing. I haven't. It's 54 here in Indianapolis, so uh, got you by about 20 degrees. It sounds like so. Yeah. Yep. We all woke up to a little, a little <laughs> bit of snow on the ground. It's that hard. really is. Yeah. It's hard to believe. Like I said, I when I was there that first day it was like 70s, I think. Or I mean, yeah. It changed quick. So it was really warm. Yes. Yeah. Warm and sunny. Yep. But it was pretty. I mean, we try to just be positive about it. Yeah. You know. Well, you have to be. So. You have to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, again, I appreciate the opportunity today. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, if anyone, uh, if there's no other questions, I think we'll. Um... Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. My daughter uh, made me a picture. <laughs> That's oh, great. Maybe we'll see it. This is. <laughs> <laughs> this is my daughter Georgia I made this picture. Thank you. Where'd you go? <laughs> you ran away. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think um maybe we'll just give everyone give everyone like a little breather, maybe, and then Sounds um, good. I'll bring I'll send everyone back to the the main room here in about five minutes or so. So sounds great. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks, yep. Andrew. We'll see you back Thank in you. the main room. Thanks. <laughs>